My name is Robert Seeger, and over the past couple of years, we've been working closely with many of you in the industry on advancing the science of measuring the popularity or the effectiveness of content at a global scale. And over this time period, we've also been coming here regularly and, and giving updates on some of, some of these advancements that we've been making in the field. And so today, I wanted to do just a quick recap of some of that work and, and to pick one specific element, one specific area to dive deeper into. You see, measuring the popularity of content used to be easy in a, in a more or less linear world, but increasingly it's becoming more difficult. We're seeing a really rapid proliferation of content distribution platforms. Uh, that's causing audiences to be more and more fragmented than ever before across those platforms, which is causing our ability as an industry to measure these audiences to be less and less effective almost with every passing month. And so the industry very, very rapidly found itself in a, almost a dire need to move and shift away from a more panel and survey-based approach to measurement to a much more empirical and holistic approach to understanding uh, consumer demand for content across all platforms. And, and many of you, I know, we work with face these challenges on, on a daily basis. And so at the heart of that is this relationship between consumers and content. And this relationship is, is very, very complex. It, depending on whether you're in, in marketing or programming or production, different insights drive different decisions in, along the value chain. And increasingly, this is be becoming even more and more complex. So let's start from the top. What is popular? How do we even define that? And the, the very definition of popularity is, is very rapidly changing. So it's almost like we, we've woken up overnight to an industry where popularity is in the eye of the beholder. And I said this last time here, you know, popularity is in the eye of the beholder, and it started catching on. And, and that's because what's popular depends on who you ask, right? So if you're a linear network and you're an ad salesperson, you live and die largely by your ad revenue, by your linear ratings. So what's popular, as far as you're concerned, is what rates well. Now, you're an ESVA platform, right? And you're head of content acquisition at an ESVA platform. And what's popular for you, you couldn't care less about the linear ratings of a show. What's popular for you is what's going to drive subscriber growth and subscriber retention. And so different people have different definitions of popularity. And yet we need a ubiquitous system that allows us to understand what people want, what content people want, what specific types of consumers are looking for. So how do we go about that? Well, we came up with a system and we called it Global Demand for Content. And the goal was to essentially design and develop a system that allows us to capture audience demand for content all around the world, regardless of where the content is or what platform it's airing on, or whether, in fact, it's airing new episodes or not. How do we go about doing that? Well, we said, how do people express their demand today? And how will they express their demand for content in the future? And immediately, the answer is the internet. There's already 4 billion people connected online very soon. The entire planet, everything we have is now connected. And within that medium, that is the internet, people engage, watch, consume, and interact with content in lots of different ways. So we said, let's go out and capture as many of these ways as possible. So whether you're watching content, streaming it, discussing it, whether you're searching for it or critiquing it, whether you're reading about it or uh, rating it, whether you're torrenting, whether you're illegally downloading it uh, or sharing it or promoting it, et cetera, et cetera. All these different interactions is an expression of demand for content. However, no, they're not all born equal. So what we had to do is develop a system that says, let's weight each of these individual signals of demand according to how much they represent. Meaning, we can probably all agree here, every single person in this room, that if I watch three back-to-back -back episodes of a TV show, that's a much stronger indication of my demand for the show than if I like, tweeted about it, right? You know, the first series of actions took me three hours. The, the, the latter action took me 30 seconds. And so this was very, very, very critical step because it allowed us to filter out a lot of the noise, especially a lot of the social noise that's out there, uh, where sometimes you get a, a small group of people that are very loud fans uh, that may sort of skew your perception of the popularity of a show, where it isn't actually a true indication of the demand for it. So we came up with a system which says, look, let's process all of these data points, and let's actually assign a weight according to how much demand every individual action represents, meaning watching an episode is a stronger indication of demand than writing a comment on a social platform. So with that in mind, five years later and many millions of dollars in R&D later, we developed a system that is now processing over a billion data points a day in over 100 languages, measuring the true 
demand for content in every single country on the planet. A system that allows us to quantify that relationship between consumers and content. So let's do a quick dive. This is the demand for the top four dramas for TV shows in the US over the past uh, four quarters this year. So we can see that sci-fi and apocalyptic dramas have taken a spike in Q4 and superhero series, the demand for superhero series by US consumers have actually taken a dip, have been steadily declining throughout the, the start of the year. Uh, let's, we'll go sort of gradually more and more deeper and, and more granularly. What were the top shows in the US last week? A fairly simple question. But immediately, the answer to which starts to surface some insights around the system that is now not bound by what show is airing new episodes or what platform a show is on, right? If there is demand for a TV show, whether that TV show is currently airing episodes or whether it's on a linear cable or ESVA platform, we should be able to measure that, and that's what we can now do. Um, let's compare the premieres for five popular TV shows across different platforms. So here we have Stranger Things, The Walking Dead, Star Trek Discovery, Mindhunter, and The Good Doctor. Five shows popular with recent popular season premieres across different platforms, linear including cable, SVOD, and the case of Star Trek, both. This is the average demand of the first seven days post-season premiere. But let's look more deeper. So here we're aligning the time periods for The Walking Dead and Stranger Things, where day zero is the day of the new season release. This is a very important chart because immediately it's beginning to highlight different business models. The biggest SVOD show premiered to higher demand in the US than a mega cable hit. Right? However, within two weeks, within 14 days, The Walking Dead's demand overtakes the demand for Stranger Things, even though Stranger Things premiered at a higher demand. And that's because all of the episodes are released at once. Intuitively, we know this, we can now measure this. This is also why SVO platforms need to have so many hours of original content where people seemingly at first didn't understand why you need like 400 to produce 400 TV shows. It's not because people watch 400 shows, it's because you lose the niche audiences for any given fan over a 14 day period, even with the biggest hits that you have. And so you need to align the spikes of demand throughout the year to m make sure that you have the best churn mitigation strategy for your subscribers to increase your lifetime value of the subscribers. Interestingly though, here's another show with Star Trek which has a dual, sort of a hybrid linear and SVOD model. So compared to The Good Doctor and Mindhunter, uh, a linear show, so The Good Doctor in green where we can see the episodic spikes and declines in demand uh, with this episodic uh, drops. Mindhunter, a usual SVOD demand curve where people finish binging on it after two weekends and then a sharp decline in demand. But look at Star Trek Discovery, not only does it premiere high, but it actually sustains its high demand with its episodic drops. Now, with a global system, we can also do this in different countries. So we can see that Stranger Things uh, premiered to higher demand in the US, whereas Mindhunter premiered to higher demand in the UK. We can compare the demand for the same shows across different countries on a per capita basis. So we see that Venezuela had the highest demand for Stranger Things prior to its premiere and actually sustained demand for much longer than any other country after its premiere. The Walking Dead, we can see Germany got amongst the top five, got excited about it, the new season, and then quickly lost interest in it. Now that's really important to someone in Germany, I promise you. Um, on the other hand, Germany for Star Trek Discovery started the same baseline level as all the other countries, but started taking a life of its own after the show started airing episodes. Three quick examples to highlight the globalization of content. We measure demand for content in places where it wasn't designed for. Scum, a Norwegian original TV show, doesn't offer English subtitles. We measured high demand for it in the US. 18 months ago, the show doesn't even have English subtitles. It doesn't air in the US, and yet there's high demand for it here. Veni Vedevici, a Swedish show, doesn't offer Spanish subtitles. We measure high demand for it in Spanish-speaking countries where the show doesn't even air. Velaya Muta, a Romanian production by HBO Europe, doesn't have Spanish subtitles, popular in Spain. These are shows which have demand in markets which they're not designed for. The world is becoming increasingly globalized. Audiences are finding this content, consuming it, and they're creating their own subtitles for it. So a very quick deeper dive. What I want to do here is highlight one specific area which we call affinity. So we can actually see the audiences for a given TV show, what else do they watch? And having this understanding allows us to understand more granularly 
the value of content, how to best program it and produce it. So we understand that the fans for Stranger Things that have the highest demand for it are 20, 21 to 35 year olds, and they also like shows like The Handmaid's Tale and Grey's Anatomy. Note, we're finding relationships between shows on different platforms. Similarly, the fans for The Walking Dead are really into Westworld and NCIS. And interestingly, the fans for Star Trek Discovery skew much, much older than the previous TV shows, and they're into shows like The Flash and Marvel's Inhumans. This is what 15 million people's online TV consumption in the US looks like over a single month. Every dot on this chart represents a TV show. The brighter the dot, the more people consume that TV show. Every line represents a propagation, meaning you watched one show and you moved on to watch another one. The brighter the line, the more people did that propagation from one show to another. This affinity chart allows us to understand things like niche content, content specifically designed and ad that addresses very niche specific audiences and mainstream content that resonates with a wider group of audiences. It allows us to understand the value of an individual program on the underlying catalog of content, right? So again, production, programming, distribution decisions based on affinity charts. By understanding the micro relationships between TV shows, when should you air it, next to what program, what platform should you air it on, what channel, but also, more macro relationships between studios, between cable networks and, and, and portfolios of content. So you can zoom in on a specific show and understand what specific other types of content or brands, what types of shampoo people or fans of Stranger Things are into, what, what cars do they drive and what they're really into. Um, and you can see this drastically different from one show to another show. Fans of Star Trek Discovery are really into their adult comedies apparently. So you can drill down deeper and deeper and deeper. So you can just say, hey, I want to highlight just Netflix content, I understand the relationship between Mindhunter and Sense8, I understand just how niche an audience Sense8 targets versus how wide stream an audience Mindhunter targets, right? And now I'm going to zoom in into The Crown. So it turns out that the fans, audiences of The Crown are really into their rugby, their tennis, and Fox News, right? By zooming and by understanding consumer behavior, what, what content people watch, what they consume, what they search for, what they critique, what they rate, and by having a global measurement system that classifies and standardizes all of that, we can start to uncover these relationships. So, one of the last things I want to leave you with is three thoughts. One, all of these relationships are country specific. Different TV shows, different platforms, different audiences in every single country in the world. And those of you who are in the international TV business know this better than most. Two, all of this we've just discovered or discussed is one element of the many elements, and we'll dig into deeper things in future presentations. And some of the things, just a quick heads up into uh, some of the upcoming things that we'll talk about. One, mapping, mapping the interaction of, of users. For example, fans interacting with an actress or a TV show directly, or an actress in multiple TV shows, or fans interacting with a book, which is also a TV show. How do you map these different interactions in the world where measuring popularity is becoming increasingly difficult. And yet these are the very same questions that we talk about when we talk about the science of popularity. Second to last point, two TV shows. One, five million people watch it and do nothing about it. TV show B, one, one million people watch it, but they express on a per person basis five times more demand. Which show is more popular? It depends on who you ask. If you're on Ezra platform looking to attract and retain subscribers, that one million people show, that is your goal. If your brand, trying to do mass, passive mass market advertising, TV show B is your gold, right? So all of these things, they're all, it's different depending on who you are in the industry. And so this seemingly simple question that we started with, which is what is popular, is actually now becoming more of a combination of art and science. And over the next few months, we'll be sharing more and more about advancements in this field. Thanks very much. Thank